دكتور ناصر ازيك يا عمر هنجرب السلايدز ولا خلاص كده مفيش وقت جربوا جربوا هنا الدكتور بروفيسور عمر يوسف بروفيسور عين شمس يونيفرستي بروفيسور فريد جنتيلي بروفيسور رامي امين ويلكم دكتور جنتيلي اتس اور اونر تو جوين اس ويلكم جريت اونر تو اس ثانك يو فيري ماتش اتس ماي اونر تو بي هير ثانك يو ويلكم دكتور رامي ويلكم دكتور عمر اهلا بيك أهلاً وسهلاً بحضرتك. بروفيسور بلتاجي جاست جوينت أس. هي إس بروفيسور من نيوسيرجي كايرو يونيفرستي. ثانك يو فور فور جوينينج محمد. ثانك يو بروفيسور ناصر. ويلكم بلتاجي. ويلكم دكتور عمر. أي فريد. أهلاً بلتاجي. ليك يا باشا لحضرتك. الله يخليك. Uh, I think it's time to start. We are late for a few minutes. Ahmed, uh, can I start? Okay, start, Doctor. Okay. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you in webinar number 13 among the series of webinars organized by the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons in collaboration with the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. 
as president of the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgery. And on behalf of all Egyptian neurosurgeons, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the presence of our speakers. Professor Fred Gentili is a well-known neurosurgeon all over the world. I don't think he needs any introduction. And uh, we are appreciating, uh, Professor Gentili, that you are accepted our invitation. You are honoring us by your contribution to our webinar. Let me also welcome uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Rami Amin, and he is uh, the, uh, the chairman of uh, oncology of, uh, of cranial surgery at the Department of Neurosurgery, Cairo University. He's also the director of the Egyptian uh, board program in the Ministry of Health. Let me welcome Professor Mohamed Beltagi, Professor of Neurosurgery at Cairo University and the chairman of the Pediatric Hospital 57357, which is well known in the Middle East. Thank you very much for joining us in this webinar. Thanks to all of you for accepting our invitation and for contribution to this activity. For those who don't have Zoom application in their mobiles or laptops, there will be a live stream of this webinar through the YouTube channel of our organization. For all the audience, you can, you can participate by chat questions or questions and answers, and we will monitor this through the panel by the moderator of this session, Professor Rami Amin. Now I will give the speech to Professor Rami Amin to start the webinar. Um. Welcome, Professor Gentili. Welcome, uh, Professor Beltagi. Uh, I would like to introduce, actually, uh, Professor uh, Gentili in uh, uh, one or two minutes. He's a professor of surgery, faculty of medicine, University of Toronto, and professor of otolaryngology, also University of Toronto, and the director of surgical education in University of Health Network, uh, a very well-known uh, neurosurgeon, and he's going to, we're going to, to start with his talk about uh, open versus endoscopic approaches for craniopharyngiomas. Thank you. Thank you. If I can uh, share my screen now, uh, can everybody see my screen? Not yet. So you have to, uh, uh, get yourself off uh, the, 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 the screen. You are, you are now on the screen, and so you have to get uh, um, minimize your screen. Ahmed? Now I see you, uh, Nasser, you have to minimize yourself or... Okay. Professor Omar Hamad, you have also to minimize your screen, please. Ahmad Magdi. Adel? Dr. Nasser. Share screen of Professor Gentili. Doctor. Huh? There is a chair button. You see, can you see my screen now? Not yet. No. Not yet. No? That's strange. Let me, uh... Doctor, from your screen, there is a share screen button, green you know, button. You know that, you know that, you know that.
Is there anybody else sharing his screen? I don't think so. Uh, I think Dr. Gentile start the presentation first, then uh, do uh, the share screen uh, second. I cannot see. I cannot see now uh, a thing to share, so I don't know what happened. Um, I may have to. Um, do you have the icon of the share screen? Is clear for you, Dr. Gentili? No, no, for some reason it's it's gone. I'm not sure why. Uh, Dr. Gentili. Yeah. From taskbar, from taskbar, zoom open in two screens or one screen. I have one screen here now, and I don't have. Uh, I have one screen. Um, that I can see, but I don't have the task part that tells me to share anymore. So I'm not sure if I have to, um, maybe uh, end show and, and, uh, and check in again. Exit uh, in my window. See, I'm there. So let me just see here. Here we go, Zoom. Uh, join meeting. I have an idea. May Dr. Biltagi uh, to make a trial for a share screen to make sure this is uh, the, the, the defect from us or from the, the side of Dr. Gentili? Just a moment. Uh... Here you go. Let me just go this again to see. That's very. <clears throat> You can see my screen now. Okay, that, that's right. This is the screen of Dr. Biltagi. Screen, but I this can't is the screen that. of Dr. Biltagi is clear. That means the defect is from the side of Dr. Gentili. Now, but I, when I put my up there, you cannot see my screen, eh? Right. There is a small screen open on right side. Small screen. Here, let me just see here. Let me open again and see if I can go. Okay, it says I'm on. Um, but I don't know why. Arrow exit minimize window. You, do you see my screen now? No. Okay. <clears throat> Fred, you have to uh, open the data show in your computer first uh, to check that it's working. And then uh, next step, you do short screen. Yeah, if it's I, working I... in your computer, it's going to, to, to be shared with us. And always allow John to open here. Open meeting. هل بيبقى في اختلاف بين ابل وبين الابل كمبيوترز؟ لما هو عمل شيرنج النهارده هو عمل شيرنج النهارده كانت شغاله عمل شيرنج على سلايدز وعلى فيديو وكل حاجه اه هو هيعمل ريجوين تاني يا دكتور نور احسن 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 هو يخرج ويخش تاني ان شاء الله تشتغل كل الحته اللي في الاول دي تشال من المونتاج يا احمد قصها كلها تحط الكلمه بتاعتي وبعدين تكمل بعد كده اول ما هو يبتدي حاضر دكتور ناصر انا سمعت ان محمد البلتاجي حط له فيروس راح له وبوظه محمد محمد النهارده ما بيضحكش اول مره يضحك اقول راجل احسن راجل يصدق غريبه ازاي هو جرب 
ازاي هو جرب وعمل شير واشتغلت بعدين دلوقتي مش هتشتغل انا مش عارف والله دي غريبه قوي كده كده هنخلص على على اربعة تور ناصر مش كده؟ اه ان شاء الله معلش لو خدت ربع ساعة زيادة ولا حاجة مش مشكلة يا رامي على اساس ان احنا ابتدينا متأخر على حسب الاسئلة بقى Can you see me now? Yes you're back professor Kintiri All right And yes. 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 Oh. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 Yes in fact, Professor Solomon, who we communicated with, and indeed the entire Egyptian uh, society for the invitation. It's my honor to, to, to do this. I, I love Egypt, a beautiful country, beautiful people, uh, very hospitable, and I've been to many places in Egypt, uh, everywhere from Cairo, even Tanta, from, uh, uh, and, and of course, beautiful uh, Alexandria and every place. And, um, um, and uh, I, I want to say that I've had an opportunity to have a number of fellows come to study with me from Egypt. Uh, uh, and uh, they're very hardworking people. The Egyptians are very hardworking people. Um, and so uh, I want to also congratulate the Egyptian uh, society to doing these educational uh, webinar. Because as you know, with this COVID business, it's been a terrible situation with regard to meetings. I've had about 10 meetings canceled or 12 meetings canceled you know, over the last six months. But, you know, this, this educational virtual thing is very useful uh, for young people, uh, particularly young neurosurgeons. So congratulations to, to, the, to the organizers of this. My talk today, very, very quickly, is the management of craniopharyngiomas, open versus endoscopic techniques. And as you can see here, basically, I rule out now versus, you know, it's a very good uh, to have a, a, how do you say, discussion. Everybody likes to have against uh, but in, in reality now, after a decade of endoscopic, uh, more than a decade, we realize that it's, it's not against anymore. It's really more end. And we realize for this typical, very difficult tumor, we need both endoscopic and open uh, uh, procedures. However, I must say that my experience, as you'll see why, over the last basically a decade, I believe that the endoscopic approach is uh, the best approach most of the time, if I can say that. Now, the, we all know about this difficult problem with uh, and Harley Cushing's back, uh, you know, uh, 90 years ago said that this was a very baffling, formidable problem. And not that I want to put myself in any way like Harvey Cushing, but Fred Gentili also in 19, 19, 2019 says, because I believe that craniofrenum does still remain a significant surgical challenge and management problem today. Despite our advances in technical virtuosity, it's still a major problem. Now, why, why is that? Yeah, because first of all, they're rare. None of us has such a high, high experience in these. And they are very surgically challenging. Why? Because they are associated with very critical structures, the visual structures, the endocrine pituitary structure, the hypothalamic structures, and vascular structures. And the interesting thing is that craniofringioma are not lethal tumors. They're not like cancers, GBM. Patients live a long time. You can see that the survival rates are high at 10 years, 90% uh, even higher. But the problem is that the tumor can cause significant morbidity, but also the treatment can cause significant morbidity. We have, that's the problem. And while surgery remains the primary form of treatment, total removal remains still very difficult. And then the, because of this, of course, there's high recurrence rates. Some people, they have to 60% or more. And, um, and so therefore, and if you look in the literature, if you go to the literature, say, okay, how do I manage this? There's really, you'll see no consensus, no standard treatment guidelines for craniofringiomas. 
So we all are aware of this. This is an uh, incidence there at the, you know, the pediatric and then the, the adult uh, um, uh, group that have these. We now know the pathology as uh, two grades, uh, two types, adamantinomatous and papillary. And this is more important now because we're developing now targeted therapies. And we know now, as I'll show at the very end, that some of these uh, particular papillary may respond to some medical therapy. And then, of course, the tumor characteristics, you know, uh, some 38% uh, uh, are, are cystic, 10% solid, but the majority, as we all know, are mixed solid. And this is interesting. There's a many classification for cringeoma, and this is a classification by one of my former Egyptian um, um, uh, resident, doc, uh, Dr. Al Swawi from Cairo. And uh, we're looking at to try to determine based on uh, anatomical criteria, what would be the best uh, uh, approach. And this is something we are still working on. So the management option of cringeoma, there are many, surgery, uh, different types of surgery, radical surgery, subtotal surgery, conservative surgery with installation of chemonucleotides. This is more for pediatric, you know, in adults, we don't use this very often. Uh, conservative surgery with the, the radiation, primary radiation. Some of these have been treated strictly by uh, radiation. And then now we have, as I said, this uh, make, uh, medical targeted therapy. The surgical approaches we all know are many for these uh, tumors many bilateral approaches that you can see here, interhemispheric, and then many unilateral approaches. My favorite open approach when I use it is the bilateral transbasal interhemispheric approach with or without lamina terminalis uh, opening. Now, of course, we have over the last decade, the transvenodal pure endoscopic uh, approach. So there are many controversies in, um, um, in uh, um, cranial pharyngioma. What is the best approach? What is the best surgical strategy? And then I have this issue, is it possible to remove a cranial pharyngioma totally, totally remove it and spare pituitary function? I have my own views on that. And then I don't have time, but the issue are pituitary, different from adults. And then I wanna just finish off by looking at re the management of recurrent because these are very difficult uh, lesions uh, to deal with, the recurrent tumors. So what is the best approach? Well, you can see my own over the last uh, decade. And the two, uh, the, I've gone over really over to the endoscopic approach both for primary lesions that you can see here and also for recurrent lesions. And, uh, and the answer is why, why have I, have, have, have I done that? Well, this is the reason. This is a 76 year old gentleman with this cranial pharyngioma. What approach? Well, this is over a decade ago. And at that time, everybody was doing this, of course, open approaches. So you can use a bacterial approach, subfrontal approach, intermospheric approach, supraorbital approach, all very good approaches. The problem for this tumor is that these approaches have limited access to these retrochiasmal, interpedancular, infrachiasmal. And this patient was treated initially by this, an open approach. As you can see, they did a very minor removal. They were worried about uh, injury to the optic nerve. So then the patient was uh, subsequently referred to me, and this is the endoscopic approach of the same tumor that you can see the, the visualization. It's like basically a new world. You, you know, you have beautiful view. Uh, here we are taking this tumor off the medial wall of the, of the uh, uh, hypothalamus. This is off the chiasm that you can see up here. You can see the PCOM uh, uh, posterior cerebral here, and here's after the removal. This patient was, uh, you know, 68. So of course we did not attempt uh, a radical removal. We left some in the in the uh, uh, wall of the uh, hypothalamus. And then here's the patient's postoperatively. You see a little residual here, but this patient eight years after is uh, remains stable. So to me, there's a significant advances to the, uh, uh, for the endoscopic approach for cranial pharyngioma. These are midline lesions, so it's the most direct approach, excellent uh, visualization, reduced manipulation of the optic nerve chiasm, and it gives you this very important easier access and removal of the infra retrochiasmal retrocellular and interpredacular tumor extensions. Now, like all procedures, there's no procedure that does not have, uh, you know, it's all advantages and no disadvantages. Every procedure has some disadvantages, and these procedures are very difficult, technically uh, challenging procedure with restricted workspace and CSF re reconstruction and CSF leak, which we have done significant progress. But anyone who tells you that that has been solved is not, you know, is not true. We still have issues with CSF leak in these tumors. We need certain prerequisite. You have to have a knowledge of a different knowledge of anatomy. We use an interdisciplinary team. I use for uh, the, here my ENT colleagues, we do these together. 
For pituitary tumors, I do alone, but when it comes to these expand, I think it's important to have a team approach. Of course, instrumentation is very important and training. So I think if you're gonna do these, you're gonna to need to do training. And that's why I have so many fellows that come and train uh, with me to, for the, uh, these approaches. Now, the anatomy, very quickly, anatomy, these are the classical uh, endoscopic approach of the to the central skull base, transcriberiform, transplantum, uh, transtuberculum, and then of course, the transclival, mainly for chordomas. For the, for the craniopharyngioma, this is basically, uh, uh, this is a, um, anatomy from one of my uh, former fellows, looking at the anatomy, the anatomy of the, uh, the approach. Here's the carotid uh, vessels, paracellar carotid, planum, tuberculum, and this is an operative uh, thing, very similar as you can see here. And then after the removal of the bone, this is basically what we remove. It's like a hexagon that you see here, including the cella. And then you get this beautiful view that you see of the cellar, supercellar area. Now, I'm just going to show you very quickly how we do this. I think it's important just to people show this is a 68 year old woman presenting with vision problems and also cognitive problems because obviously hydrocephalus and hypothalamic involvement. What is the best approach for this? Well, for me now, this would be an endoscopic approach. And then very, very quickly, I will show you what, what we do with this. So initially, we do a middle turbinectomy to give us uh, exposure, uh, better exposure uh, on here. And uh, this, uh, I'll just very quickly go here. The next major step, these are just a maxillotomy that the INT people do. And then uh, ultimately, this is the posterior ethmoid. And now the next major phase is the uh, uh, harvesting of the nasal septal vascularized flap. This is very critical for, for uh, CSF leak, and it's, it's helped us significantly reduce the CSF leak uh, rates that, uh, that you can see. And uh, now I won't bother you with just showing, but this is the way we remove the flap. Uh, and then uh, we also take another flap from the, the, the opposite side. So we actually have two flaps here. And then the next major thing, of course, is the sphenoidotomy. And here we are, what I showed you in the anatomy. This is the planum, here's the cella, here's the optic uh, prominence here, paracellar carotids here. And then uh, we uh, thin out the bone very uh, carefully. Uh, being very careful here, the, uh, the carotid vessel here. We also do a transcellar uh, uh, exposure. Said that we want to push down the, the pituitary gland to allow us to go in the uh, retro uh, uh, interpeduncular area. And then uh, we remove, uh, we open the dura, as you can see here. And, uh, and, and then basically there is the tumor. And then basically we use microsurgical technique exactly the way we'd be using under the microscope. So there's not a one hand or anything like that. You use exactly the same microsurgical technique uh, that we do. And then I'm not going to bore you to show you, you know, the dissection, but we quickly dissect that uh, out. And then at the end, we look at here and here's the basic pituitary stock over here. Uh, there we go. And there's the mammary bodies back there, basilar artery, pituitary stock that you can see here. Um, and then uh, this patient is 68. We then uh, try to spare the pituitary stock. Uh, and uh, then the next important thing, as you can see here, look at this, the tumor uh, capsule on the third ventricle that you can see here. So it appears someone who's 68 is no, no indication to try to remove this from the thir third ventricle uh, and that, time. that would be very dangerous. And so this uh, we, uh, we left. Now, reconstruction is very important in these. So this is our multi-layer reconstruction with an inlay fascia lata. I always use a biological material. I think it's very critical. Um, and then an onlay fascia lata, you can see here. And finally, then we bring up the nasal septal flap. So that is our multi-layer closure for these tumors. And this is patient uh, one day post-op. You see he had air, still hydrocephalus by three months. However, it come down very nicely, as you can see, and this is the residual that we left on the pituitary stock. This patient, despite an attempt to spare the stock, the patient was pan hypopith. So now with this patient, we basically will observe, and at the first sign of any increase, then we will consider uh, treatment with radiation. He's two years stable. This is a 45-year-old patient with this solid cystic. What is the best approach? Well, for me now, there's no question that the endoscopic approach for me is the better approach uh, for this lesion. And then again, just to show you very briefly uh, how we do it, the same thing. And I just want to emphasize the importance of this approach that allows us basically to look at the uh, uh, vascular supply 
uh, here. Look at these vessels. These are very important vessels to spare to the chiasm because I think many times you will have a de de decrease in function after surgery. And I don't think it's techno mechanical. I think it's vascular. You do not see these vessels as well from the uh, open approaches. You can see this patient significant improvement in his vision, eight years, uh, no evidence of uh, uh, disease recurrence. And I can go on and show you larger lesions, smaller lesions that can have a very nice uh, 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 endoscopic removal. However, like any approach, there are limitations. And uh, these are my limitations. Obviously, this tumor I'm not going to do endoscopically. This is definitely not an endoscopic approach. So significant lateral extension, multiple cranial fossa, purely interventricular tumor. I do not think it's very good because you have to transgress the hypothalamic floor. And of course, the surgeon experience is important. So this patient, 39 years of age with this uh, large craniopharyngioma, some of my colleagues might do this endoscopy. For me, no, I think this is too narrow, going so far laterally that I did this using an open intermospheric transcolosal approach that we would do it. And you can see we did a very nice removal here. However, we did leave a very small little nubbin at the very end of our approach. So what we do with these, we watch these very carefully. And you can see one year postoperatively, rapid uh, uh, the, uh, cystic recurrence. And now, of course, this is a very beautiful uh, uh, expanded endoscopic approach. And this is after the removal of the tumor. This patient, as you can see here now, is uh, five years and stable disease. Now, what is a post-surgical strategy? And there's a lot of controversy uh, uh, with this. And I'm sure my next speaker on, in pediatric will also uh, go on to this. There's been a significant pendulum swing from radical excision at all costs to now a more conservative sparing, uh, function sparing uh, technique. And the answer is why has this happened? Well, it's happened because of this problem. A, a radical removal results in significant, significant, uh, 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 first of all, hormonal disturbance. This is uh, Yasergill, who I trained with many years ago, uh, looking at 86% DI, permanent replacement 87, post-op obesity in 50% of patients. And this is my, also my friend, Marie Shu, a very, very well-known, famous pediatric neurosurgeon, looking at the, the study of 138 patients, even after attempts at radical removal up to 30, 40% of, of tumors still recur. So because of that, you know, the, the significant cost of a radical resection with endocrine, hypothalamic, morbid obesity, poor quality of life, that's the why it's gone over to the, the con more conservative approach. And, uh, and you know, do we have data about this approach? Well, it looks like this is in the pediatric that, that we do. This is pro progression-free survival and overall survival. And if you look at gross total removal and, and uh, subtotal removal and radiation, there are basically, basically no significant difference. And this is similar uh, uh, data in the adults that's coming out. So we have to be very important, very careful to uh, keep this in mind when we're making decisions about whether how radical we should be with these tumors. So this patient, 63 years of age, you can normal endocrine function, you can see this lesion. Uh, what is approach? Well, it's endoscopic approach. I'm not gonna show you the video because of time. Um, and, but this patient, as you see postoperatively, had some residual disease. Uh, again, we, he still hypopit. And this patient, what do we do? We observed him. So in three years later, he had evidence of progression, as you can see here. So we, at that point, went to radiation. Here he is 16, and here is a 17 significant reduction. And this patient remains very stable now. So there is a role for radiation. As neurosurgeons, generally, we don't, don't like radiation. But in reality, there are times, times there, it, is, it is a good option. And this is a, a, from a, a Hirabali, uh, a radiation oncology, looking at the median uh, local recurrence rates, um, uh, local control rates, I should say, at, at long term. This is at five years, 95%, 10 years even, not even 88%. So radiation really has a role to play, if I can say, in craniopharyngioma. Uh, very quickly, is it possible to remove a craniopharyngioma and spare all pituitary function? I always believe that in open approaches, this was really not possible except for rare exceptions. Uh, then with the endoscopic, I said, well, maybe now we can, we are able to see better, we can we spare these. So just to show you a, a patient uh, that uh, we operated on, this is a very nice tumor, very small tumor, soft tumor, that if any tumor you could, uh, and it's exophytic to the stalk. So if there's any tumor that you could remove and spare the stalk, this would be one. And so this is what we did. And you can see very nice soft tumor. 
And this is after the uh, removal that you can see here. Um, and we're taking it out. We're looking at uh, the stock on this side after removal, total removal of the tumor, and we spared the pituitary stock. Look at that, okay? So my feeling was that now with endoscopic approaches, maybe we can, you know, spare the, 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 the stock and spare pituitary function. Uh, and this patient, as you can see here, uh, uh, had a, an improvement. He had transient DI, but normal pituitary function. And three years later, you can see a nice uh, stock uh, preservation. However, if you follow these patients, and we did at three and a half years, look at this recurrence with a cystic recurrence right in the region of the stock. And, uh, and uh, so my feeling is that the answer is that you, it's rare that you can, then we, of course we did an endoscopic approach, uh, did a whole a pure hypothesectomy, and this patient uh, is now, uh, I think five or six years out. So the answer to this to me is, is rarely. I think you know, in medicine, you can never say never, never say always, but it's rarely that you can spare the stock and remove the endo, uh, the pituitary, uh, uh, at least the cranial pharyngioma totally. So you have to keep this in mind and we need to talk to patients about that. You know, when you're gonna go in, you have to tell the patient, I can try a radical removal, but you're gonna be a pan pit on medication, or I can try a more, uh, you know, is, uh, deal with your vision problem, deal with everything, but I may have to leave a little bit and there's a risk it could recur, but then we have you know, the possible radiation. So finally, the last thing is uh, recurrent uh, tumors. And I think these are a real problem. Uh, the recurrent rates are common up to 62% if you follow them long enough. The median uh, time to recurrence you see here. And, and the total recurrence rates are very, uh, uh, the growth tumor rates are significantly less. Uh, these are the same treatment options, but I think we can say that the treatment for recurrent craniofrenal often requires a multidisciplinary approach. If you cannot remove a craniofrenal on the first surgery, the likelihood on the second surgery is extremely, extremely remote. So it's a 52-year-old patient. What is the best approach here? Uh, this patient we, uh, <clears throat> we did using, a, 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 I just wanted to say, why do craniofrenal recur? Why do they recur? Well, this is why they recur. Uh, some of them. This is a cranial pharyngioma that I showed you there. We're going to just be very briefly, uh, very quickly, go right over. And uh, you've seen this before, so I'm not going to bother with you. But when we go through, this is what we see. So you see basically the, the, the capsule on the carotid, uh, on the uh, 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 artery, uh, anterior cerebral, on the, um, um, on the chiasm. This is a tumor that is not possible to remove at all. Nevertheless, you can still do a very good uh, decompression. And you can see here, we are taking this tumor off very, very, uh, here, if I can go over here, we're taking it off the, the chiasm, very nice, careful microsurgical technique. You can see a posterior communicator going back and you can do, and here's a stock, but there's no, no way here that I wanna take the stock to think that I've got a total removal. So this way I, I spare the stock and then I take this tumor out, uh, at least the, the component, I decompress optic uh, uh, chiasm, and this is after the removal. So you can do a good removal, decompress it, but do not suggest that you've got a total removal of this kind of tumor. And that's why these tumors re uh, recur. So this patient, as you can see, had some residual disease. We observed this, uh, this, uh, this, this tumor. Uh, and it's a case uh, with a tear neuron. I'm not sure how much time I have, but I think I'll pass this case. It's a long case just to show you how these tumors can recur. We did this patient initially open, uh, uh, post-op. Uh, we observed him, but then one year later, he had a, a decrease with a cystic recurrence. Then we did an endoscopic, transposed the pituitary gland. You, if you do this, you 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 injure the pituitary gland permanently. So transposition of the pituitary gland is not, uh, is not really feasible. And then further recurrence, six months, transventricular endoscopic, and then finally uh, radiation, and uh, this patient is stable. So sometimes these, uh, they need all of the uh, approaches and treatments. And this patient with radiation uh, and, and a craniotomy now comes in with recurrence. So endoscopic can be used for, re, uh, for recurrent disease, you have to be careful, but uh, just to quickly show you here, uh, after the removal, of course, you're not gonna get a total removal. And this patient now is five years, as you can see here, uh, stable disease. So let's look at uh, some very quickly, some, uh, some uh, an added, at least some data, because we need data. This is, a, this is a, uh, a paper that we published about a year ago 
on a large series of 40 patients with uh, craniopharyngioma with endoscopic approaches. You see 50% were virtually already recurrent lesions. The average size very quickly. Their growth hormonal rates was only 44% in the entire series. But in primary lesion, not the recurrent, we were able to get 73%, and, but very, very uh, good uh, visualization outcome, 90% stable and improvement in outcome. The mortality zero, the CSF leak very high initially, as we, as we said, but with our nasal septal flaps, it's now at least less than 10%, but it's not zero. And uh, you can see here the medium follow. This is very important because we followed up the patients initially for 56 months uh, and the recurrence rate was 14%. But then we waited uh, another two years uh, before we, we were able to publish this and another nine patients recurred. So, we, so total recurrence was 35%. So you see when you read uh, uh, papers, you have to look at the follow-up. And craniopharyngioma and meningioma, a two-year follow-up, three-year follow-up means nothing in terms of recurrence rates. And then we also did a, page, uh, a management of recurrent meningiomas. And I just want to show you here how, how uh, very, very uh, um, gross tumor rates was only 19%. Very, very low uh, in, in recurrent tumors. Uh, vision was uh, showed the improvement and, uh, and there's uh, the complication, CSF leaks rates are 11%. And then if you go in the literature, you see that the endoscopic approach appears to have uh, a better uh, uh, outcome than the, than the open approach. This is from uh, the Pittsburgh group. Again, the total recurrence was very similar to us, as you saw, 34%. And this is a, another one with 3,000 cases showing that the endoscopic approach probably a slightly better uh, uh, in terms of um, gross total removal tumor rates. However, you have to be careful for, for, with all of these uh, meta-analyses because often they are, uh, they are comparing apples and oranges because case selection is different for the open approach and the open, and the, so you have to be very, very careful. So in conclusion, this is my uh, conclusion based on evidence-based review, looking at level of evidence and, and recommendations. So we don't have any level one. We don't have a randomized study. So we have to look at other levels of evidence that we have, you can see here. So based on this, I can say that the management of craniopharyngioma remains a significant surgical challenge with high rates of recurrence, regardless of which approach you do. Craniopharyngioma should be considered a chronic disease because it's going to be coming back, coming back, and coming back. And so the, the aim should be uh, looking at the quality of life of the patient. They're going to be uh, alive for 10, 20 years. And if you have a, a significantly compromised patient, that's not a good, uh, a good um, um, uh, uh, treatment. And then I believe that the endoscopic approach really has significant advantages, uh, 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 as I showed before. And also, subtotal removal uh, sometimes and radiation is a valid strategy, particularly when attempts, you know, are going to cause significant risk to the patient's quality of life. So this is basically one surgical approach. No one surgical approach can be considered the best approach for all patients, and each patient is best served by the formulation of a tailored individual surgical, take into account the patient, but also the, uh, the tumor, the tumor, but also the patient. So thank you for your, for your attention. I think I will not go into the treatment. We have treated some patients with uh, medication uh, and some of them we've had some good results. Uh, this is a, a targeted therapy. Some patients have had some good results, but other patients have not. So we still do not know about medical therapy. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Rami. Dr. Rami. Thank you very much, Professor Gentili, for this great uh, talk. I think we have uh, some questions from uh, Dr. Muhammad Arnaud. What is your remarks for the current cases using the Indonesian approach? Do you use a contralateral nasoceptal flap for reconstruction? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so the answer is you saw my last case there that, you know, we did an endoscopic approach for recurrence. So recurrent does not, does not limit, it does not prohibit an endoscopic approach, particularly if, if they've had a, uh, an open approach. 
if he's talking about uh, you've done already one open uh, endoscopic approach and then can you do a second endoscopic approach? And the answer to that is yes. And what we do there, the nasal septal flap is such that you can take down the nasal septal flap. We cannot use the, the flaps on the other side is gone because of our bimanual uh, uh, approach. So there's no other flap to take. Some people have used the inferior turbinate flap, but in general, you know, we, uh, we try to take down the, the previous flap and then we use, uh, uh, again, fascia lata, inlay, onlay, and fat. Um, may I have a question, Dr. Nasser? Yes, yes, of course. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gentile, for the, the, this interesting lecture and for uh, exhibiting this great uh, experience uh, all over the years. Uh, just I, uh, I would like to know from your great experience, is there any advantages or differences between the use of the endoscopic assisted uh, through the supraorbital approach versus the endoscopic transfloidal or extended approach uh, uh, impacting on the recurrence and on the uh, visual uh, function? Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the endos I, I don't use that and I have to admit, you know, I'm either an endoscopic or open. Uh, and I brought in occasionally the endoscope in an open approach. But I think there's, you know, the, the endoscope is a beautiful instrument that allows to look uh, around and so forth. So I have no problem with the use of an endoscopic approach in an open uh, uh, approach. It can maybe uh, show areas that are hidden by, you know, the microscope you can. So, and I think there may be advantages to that for, for the, endo, you know, the, the open approaches. So, yes, I think there's a, there's a, a role to, uh, for the uh, endoscopic assisted microsurgical uh, open approach. Uh, the impact of this uh, on the visual function uh, and the recurrence, is there any difference in this impact? I don't think we have any data. You see, as you know, this is something that we have to have enough cases to be able to say that by using the endoscope in an open approach, I got a better visual. There's no data in the literature, no data uh, anywhere that I know that would say that, yes, that, that, uh, you know, that, that helps. Intuitively, you think it would. Intuitively, you think it would because it allows you to see the, the optic nerve, the chiasm, may be able to see the vascular supply that I showed you I can see very well from, the, from below. So maybe intuitively suggest that there may be a better outcome, but, but there's no data, no hard data. Thanks again. Thank you. Professor Gentili, I, I just want to ask a question. I, I don't know if it was asked because I had internet problem and I had to reconnect again. Uh, do you have any major vascular injury uh, yeah. doing the endoscopic approach. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I'm lucky and I touch wood every time I see this because I'm sure it's going to happen. But I fortunately have not had, you know, and, and you know, in the literature has been reported perforator injuries from, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, perforators from the uh, um, posterior cerebrals that go up because when he's retrochiasmal. I fortunately have not. I guess, you know, I, I you have to be very, very careful understanding the anatomy and knowing when to say, no, I'm not going to go any for there because that is risk and I'm not going to risk the patient, you know, for an attempt. So maybe I'm, I'm maybe not as radical as I am, but I have not. But there has been reported and for sure that is a, a risk uh, to the endoscopic approach. And in your opinion, in addition to leaving part of the, of the, of the craniopharyngioma to avoid uh, um, hormonal and uh, visual post op problems. Um, what's the most predictive factor that you think you can find in the surgery and this predicts that this patient is mostly going to have a recurrence? Because I'm sure you had patients who did not, you left the residual part, but it was stable over the years, yeah. it didn't regrow, and then patients where you did not yeah. expect to have a recurrence and then they had a recurrence. Yeah, you know, that's a very good question and we don't have an answer. And I think, you know, from the pituitary, uh, at least from the pediatric experience, you see that these are very strange lesions. You have a patient that you operate. I have a patient I was going to show, you know, uh, who was operated on with an open approach for craniopharyngioma 25 years ago. Never a recurrence with residual. They have left a residual, never recurred. Then you have the one I showed you, that the one here that had 100 recurrences. And at this stage, 
we do not have any. We know that you know uh, the childhood craniopharyngiomas, and my the other next speaker may talk to that, are a little bit more aggressive. The adamantinomatous, so there's a higher risk, I think, of coming back. But in terms of the why some recur, why some don't, why some are cystic, uh, we don't have a hard hard. Uh, uh, data again, information as to why. If we could predict, that would be great, you know. And uh, and that's why, because we don't know that, that's why my philosophy is generally with regard to radiation to not jump into radiation. You know, you have this the residual you see there. Watch it, you know, carefully. You know, watch it, and then we see some that never. In the next one, I saw six months. You know, the the, the cyst came back. So it's unpredictable. Uh, and I watch it, and only when I see evidence of of uh, growth do I consider radiation. And the radiation, by the way, in these are all IMRTs fractionated. You know, gamma knife generally is not a good one because of the, you know, the optic uh, apparatus. Um, last question. Last question. Um, is there any parameter in the uh, histopathological uh, study of the tumor removed that could indicate that this tumor might recur? Yeah, that's a good question. As I said, I think the one is just the ad, uh, the adenom adenomatous, adenomatous and the, yeah. We know that that, but within the air, I, I I'm not sure they've done this as good as a pituitary. You no, know, they look at MIBs in these. You know, the and some they say twenty percent for us is very high, and uh, you know, so that hasn't been uh, I think uh, carefully analyzed, and that would be actually uh, something I would you know look uh, have somebody look at to see whether any histological, specific histological features, let's say of papillary, that you know would tend to show recurrence or adamantinomatous. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have a, a real answer to that. At least there's no knowledge that I know that any, any specific uh, histological features. May I ask a question, please? <clears throat> May I yes, ask? Professor yes. Osama Khanam, please proceed. Yes. What about cases I uh, wanted to be absolutely sure um, for to stop recurrence by um, excising the pituitary stroke? Uh, do you have a percentage of um, diabetes and separatus in spite that you're leaving an intact um, hypothalamus? Yeah, I think the, the, the issue is that, uh, um, you know, uh, we, as you saw in my cases, some cases that I tried to spare the pituitary stock, but patient panhypopit. Any manipulation, any significant involvement. And so, you know, and, and uh, in terms of, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in also diabetes insipidus. So what my philosophy is, is, is when I have a patient uh, with a, a tumor that I think I can take it all out, but I know that I have to take the stock, I will tell the patient. I will say, mm -hmm. I have the option here. Uh, this is an intelligent patient who can make, you know, uh, that I can go in and try to remove this all, but I will have to take the stock if I feel that I can get it all. Uh, but that means you're going to be on medication the rest of your life, thyroid, uh, testosterone, or whatever it is, estrogen, uh, thyroid. Or I can say, because it's, it's, I can say I can, you know, deal with your problem if it's vision. I can do a good removal, but I will, uh, uh, you know, uh, spare the stock. I will not take the stock, and there'll be some residual. But there's a chance of recurrence. And then, you know, the patient decides. And I have some patients which will say, I, I don't care, take everything. I don't want this to come back. If you can remove it all, you know, it's not in the, involving the hypothalamus, then take it. Or other patients say, no, I don't want to, you know, have these, uh, these medications. Just if you have to leave and you're telling me that there's possibility to recur, but it's not 100%, and then there's treatment for it, don't take it. So, I, you know, the patient is an important person, I think, in the management of these, in terms of discussions with these. It's very important to, to include the patient. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okay, Romy, there's uh, a question, uh, Dr. Romy. Uh, no, I think, we, I, uh, is, um, I think we should uh, maybe leave the questions to the end yeah. and please proceed to the next speaker, Professor Beltagi, because it's now four minutes to four and we are running late. Yes. Okay, uh, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Gentili, for this nice presentation. We already have uh, had a conversation on the plane from uh, Vienna to Marrakesh two years ago when we met about the endoscopic approach to cranial pharyngiomas and the limitation in the I will be just talking on the part of pediatric. So our experience in cranial pharyngioma is uh, past years in the pediatric population. As uh, we know that the most challenging pediatric brain tumors are the pharyngiomas and it represents three to 4% of these childhood cranial tumors. Uh, of course, the presentations differ, but most of them, they went lately with increased intracranial pressure or visual affection. So, they are pathologically different from adult, as we mentioned, they are adamantinomatous type in comparison to adult, which is papillary type. We make the pathology a little bit different in the children. The origin is different from the epithelial remnants of the rascus pouch, and there are some genetic different uh, mutations in the beta catenine, which affect the wind signaling pathway. That's in children, which is, on the other hand, in adults, is the BF mutation. Always when you talk about cranios in children, you're talking about a child who is going to live his life in uh, quality, of life which you have to take care of. This quality of life includes his rate of growth, hormones, vision, school performance, ration, a lot of other things than a nice scan with a removed tumor and obese, dwarf, aggressive child. This makes it more challenging in children than in adults. Our experience in the last 12 years, we have just published in last, mo uh, last months our experience experience till 2017 in 137 cases from a single center with a high flow in the Children's Cancer Hospital of Egypt and also another publication which we have just finished uh, two months ago with the SAI protocol and adapting the guidelines for treating such cranial pharyngiomas in low and middle income settings. Our registry is 160 children with antinomatous type, and when they presented it 139, which is headache and visual failure in the primal action, and some presented with hypothalamic affection from the beginning, as I said, with large tumors. We started first with the gross total resection in 58% was our initial experience. When we followed up these cases for more than five years, we found that we have some of them that had some salamic manifestation and endocrine and gross hormone deficiency that made them life miserable during the long following years, which we made us shifted to another, which is a sub or a near total, leaving less than one and a half centimeter and giving radiotherapy. Or cyst parts where we have only cystic craniopharyngiomas with a very small uh, noble or solid part, minimal preserving uh, an OI or a biopsy and starting interferon or giving radiation. We have followed up after the surgery, those who have been totally excised, this was early experience, and then those who have been partially excised, we gave radiotherapy in two parts, either immediate or late, and with OI with interferon. The follow-up group included 74 patients with 83 in Egypt and only three patients with interferon due to the deficiency of this in Egypt. The extent of resection that had been shown and the radiotherapy uh, given radiation after partial X-ray. So our management protocol depends mainly on a maximum possible excision and adjuvant therapy for residual conservative surgery and adjuvant therapy. That's how we deal with it's not the same to subtotally excise it. It is based mainly on your intraoperative assessment of the lesion, as well as a radiological appearance, which means that when Stephanie Peugeot declassified the craniopharyngiomas into uh, parts attached involving compressing hypothalamus, it is really 
still differentiate from the MRI only into these stages. So we based our classification mainly intraoperatively by assessing the craniopharyngioma residue and its attachment to the hypothalamus or the underneath of the chiasm where the optic uh, nerve receives its blood supply. This was helped greatly by the endoscopic assistance during the management. So always the goal is to totally excise safely and whenever you have attachment or involvement to the hypothalamus, leaving intentionally the least possible attached to the invasion hypothalamus. And as I mentioned, the cystic parts or the cystic ones can be easily inserted on Omaya endoscopically or stereotactic or open surgery. Conservative surgery concept, this concept is greatly aided again by the neuroendoscopy where we can visualize an unrecognized part in the course and help careful non-blind dissection of the tumor because the hypothalamus is a structure which does not like to be manipulated well. It is shifted away from the midline but this, by this tumor which grows with the kid and it is not usually uh, predicted where the hypothalamus will be. It is usually apart from the midline where you have to be careful not to pull on the craniopharyngioma as the hypothalamus is very vulnerable. In this case, you ha we have excised the tumor open by a terional approach. That's the follow-up MRI. You cannot see any residual, but in the introducing the endoscope, you can see a very small residual that is attached to the underneath of the chiasm and to the hypothalamus, where pulling is also as uh, risky as endangering the hypothalamus and should be carefully removed to the maximum this part could be missed if we didn't use the endoscope assistance. We have re, re, uh, collected the progression cases and to see the number of progressions in these patients where we had the follow-up group 25 only had no progression, which means that if they have been totally excised, there have been cases which progressed, which means that the pathology or the sub-pathology classification of group is not only adamantinometers, but there is another uh, different pathologies in different patients, which means that each patient be treated individually and there is no generalized treatment for these cranials in children. The median time to progression in the follow-up group was 20 months and the median time to progression in the radiotherapy group was 44 months. Again, uh, the five-year progression interval was 32.3 and the follow-up group was 34.49. The radiotherapy group was 72.25. So univariable regression shows that radiotherapy as an initial management after the initial surgery decreases the risk of progression by 70.38% with AS, which is very significant than using the radiotherapy late. When we have a progression, our aim of movement is to minimize the recurrence, preserve the hypothalamic pituitary acts and the quality of life. And that should be individualized with multimodal management. We need an endocrinologist, a psychologist, and an ophthalmologist, and together with the radio, uh, neurosurgeon. There are the 77 recorded progressions we have. We just followed up nine. We have re-excised one, re-excised two with Umaya at seven with radiotherapy, Umaya in 19. So they are differently managed according to the presentation, the size, and the function which is left behind. The interferon group, we used three patients only, which we up after four five uh, years, we had one progression and we were not able to continue with the interferon due to its unavailability. What about beta catenin? It's a cytoplasmic protein that mediates the gene transcription and cell to cell adhesion, activating a mutation in the gene encoding that have been identified in the ondimentinometers craniopharyngiomas. The went bus way signaling is dysregulated in this type of cranius. 
and the apparent membranous beta catenin expression pattern have been associated with a worse outcome, which means even if it is totally excised in such cases, it recurs. Maybe this is the basis for future targeted therapy, which we are studying now, and we assessed 102 cases with this cranial beta catenin, and the positive expression was present in 68 uh, cases. Accordingly, we differentiated this positive expression into cells, which means that the five-year progression free for those that have less than 5% mutation versus to have more than 5% mutation was 92 compared to 85. So long as it is apparent and with a high percentage, we prefer giving radiotherapy even if it is totally excised. That's our uh, uh, conclusion from this beta catenin study. The endocrine status of the cases, as you can see in this chart, comparing both the follow-up and the radiotherapy group is not big difference. Again, for the main complaints for endocrine was mostly diabetes insipidus in both follow-up group and radiotherapy group. And they were the eight placement cases in the follow-up group and in the radiotherapy group. It's also the same to ophthalmology outcome where there is no big difference that is significant between the follow-up and the radiotherapy group. I just show you some of the cases. This is one of a slide that shows most of the craniopharyngiomas in children. They could never be treated at the same protocol. We could never say that this case could be treated endoscopically. This could be treated open only. This is stereonal, this is anterior interhemispheric. This could be always different. And the pathology in the adamantinometers is different. This is a nine-year-old patient who presented with headache. That's the scans. We just went inside through a terional approach, going dissecting. This is the optic nerve, right optic. That's the right carotid artery. We have to work through all the planes, oculomotor carotid triangle or lamina terminalis. And that's to make a space and create planes where we just start the deep thing and later introducing an endoscope to see the attachments to the hypothalamus and the underneath of the chiasm. That's our starting some debulking from the lamina terminalis and the carotid oculomotor triangle, then introducing the endoscope where you can see the residual of the tumor and its attachment without pulling blindly. After dissecting this by endoscopic assistance, you can still remove safely and inspect usually with the endoscope down to the basilar artery and the third ventricle. That's the stem, the basal artery and perforators, and the remnant of the capsule, the pituitary stalk. And again, a residual that is attached to the hypothalamus. That's the post-operative images of this kid. Immediate one is in the 48 hour, and that's a one year follow-up MRI. Another case, with this huge craniopharyngioma reaching to the angle and this calcification around where we started again with a terional approach, going step by step through the terional, exposing the optics and the carotid, looking for the solid part and dissecting with creation of planes. We're removing the largest part safely with whole calcification and then introducing the endoscope through the terional approach, the optic, the carotid, the fourth cranial nerve, the basilar, and you can see down to the CP angle where we can see the 
three, seven, eight complex, and delivering the cyst from the CT angle after endoscopic inspection and going back again with the endoscope, that's the seventh eighth, the acoustic meatus. This is the post-operative images through a left reunion approach and that's six months follow-up. This is another case of a huge craniopharyngioma, which is all solid. The same approach is a terional approach. I usually believe when I uh, in, 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 in uh, Zurich that all surgeries could be done through a terional or a retrosigmoid, as I have learned. This is easily educated to other neurosurgeons, which is the approach of choice for most, but you have to use all tools, be safe and see around without endangering any of the structures. That's again, removing piecemeal till you have a chance to introduce your scope and look around to see any residual. As you can see, that's the residual attached to the underneath of the optic chiasm solid parts that could be removed under vision and inspection and that's the follow up this was totally sized as you can see this part attached to the hypothalamus which we intentionally left and we started the radiation therapy after 3 years he developed this again where we have inserted again an Omaya and did another debulking. That's after one year, after the second recurrence. This is another case. We have immediate post-operative follow-up, one year follow-up and three years follow-up. Another case again, till five years follow-up, you can see that there is no recurrence, although in others, which have been totally excised, you can see a recurrence easily after one year. This is one of the challenging cases which I had in a four-year-old female which did intraoperative endoscopic viewing and was able to, to remove it all from a terional approach. This was a right terional approach and the tumor was quite solid and large I just make the video fast. Same technique, removing most of the solid part. This was, this was what I have seen through the terione, but every time I introduced the industry, I found a, another huge part that is hidden below until reaching back. You can see how big we are delivering it from behind, but also every now and then assessing by the endoscope to find any invasion or attachments until completely introducing the endoscope into the third ventricle the choroid plexus third ventricle and the tumor was excised through a terrional approach this could have been done again with uh, two approaches this is how we can reduce just in a cystic craniopharyngioma through a cochlear bear hole, just taking a sample and introducing the OMAI on vision, and then starting either interferon if, av if available or radiotherapy. That's introduction of an OMAI, a cochlear bear hole, transventricular. And that's the follow-up. You can see that we just did a bear hole and introduced an OMAI, and that's the sort of which is not worth removing, just follow uh, by radiation therapy. So our proposed algorithm, which we have just mentioned, is when you have a new patient with a craniopharyngeal, you have to look for 
any manifestation of increased intracranial tension, preferably go to surgery. If you have a waiting list, you do a shunt. If it is stable, completely calcified, we just go for radiation. If cystic lesion, we have a ventricular uh, way to put an omaya, open more endoscopically, and then look for the solid. If it's a small, then radiation. If it's a large, then we go again for open surgery. So push this same way. Mix it solid and uh, cystic. We did an open surgery with intraoperative assessment with endocrine uh, with endoscopic. And whenever hypothalamus is invaded, we just near total and then radiation or subtotal, then gross total and follow up. We just have to do catechin. If it is above ten percent, we prefer doing immediate radiation therapy. Craniopharyngioma is a highly challenging tumor, especially in pediatric age group, and very precise and wise decisions are always needed, especially in the initial management. The concept of conservative management must be kept in mind in dealing with these tumors. The multimodal management and uh, multi-teams should be used in order to tailor individualized treatment. What's the future perspective? What we are now studying that the rationale that this microenvironment and cranios have an inflammatory cell release with cytokines, the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate is recognized as an important source. And several studies have demonstrated that association of this NOx with cancer cell growth and proliferation. We propose to explore the dynamics of this NOx in the with the association with cancer progression and whether a crosstalk of NOx and microenvironments. So elevated levels of ILs and probably other cytokines in the tumor environment could be uh, tested and in, in intervention to reduce this ROS production by targeting the NOx may, be dis may disrupt the inflammatory cycle and, pre and prevent the recurrence and proliferation. This is by the assessment of the cytokines and determination of the NOx inside the tumor uh, cell. That's what we are now studying in this different adamantinum. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beltaghi. Um, are there any questions for Professor Beltaghi? Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, Fred Gentili. So thank you very much. Yeah, Fred. Fred. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Sure, Fred. Thank you very much. Very, very nice uh, the presentation. Um, and, and as you've shown, uh, uh, there's a, the endoscope has a significant role to play. Now, I know even my pediatric colleagues in the hospital, sick children, you know, very, that there's a resistance uh, to, to pure endoscopic approach transnasal. And I understand that many of your tumors are not candidates for that. You know, they're, they're t very large, whatever, so not a candidate. But do you? Uh, do you do any where you see, a, a, you know, an obvious, um, uh, and, and I was going to say, and there's also many anatomical restraints in children, you know, too small, you don't, the sphenoid, the nasal thing. But do you, uh, if you have one that is amenable, do you do any uh, endoscopic uh, uh, approach, pure endoscopic yeah, approach? I, I, yeah, I have did about four cases in pure endoscopic endonasal with our ENT consultant, and we went, this was above 11 years, and were only a small solid part. This was, we have managed to remove two of them totally, but two, the other two left it were behind. The, the thing that when we introduce the endoscope, it's too small, despite he made a good exposure, but still I feel cooling on tumor from below that I cannot see the underneath of the chiasm or have uh, enough planes to work around because of the calcium and the attachments. That we, that me feeling unsafe uh, to pull under the, on the, and if we repeat one of these cases through transcranial, we have a serious CSF leak. That's another point that we open from below and open from above. And uh, I had also one case right now that has been referred to me one week ago uh, that been operated in Oman from Indonesia, and they managed to remove only one third of the tumor. So this, uh, we had to go transcranially again, and we are afraid of serious CSF leak. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are some limitations for pure Indonesia. Still, 
above 10 years or eight years, we can still select uh, some cases to be done endonasally. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions uh, for Professor Beltagi? Okay, then we move to, do, to the next talk by Professor Fred Gentili about management of ma uh, uh, giant pituitary adenomas. Okay, let me see where we are now. Um, can you uh, minimize? Beltagi, could you minimize, please? Ahmed Magdi, are you can you help Ahmed? Hello, doctor. I can. Uh... You cannot see my screen. No, we can't. What you see now, doctor? So, um, okay, cancel. So, uh, let me just share screen. No, that's not the yes. one. Okay. Yes, that's it. Yeah, but, but that's it, not the one. That's not the that's one. The same to, yeah, that's the previous talk. Yeah. There. And uh, can you see it now? Yes. Good. Yes, okay. yes. So very quickly, uh, my talk, second talk is on uh, giant adenomas. And I thought I'd just very briefly also uh, talk a little bit on recurrent because these are two major, major issues. So many controversies in pituitary uh, surgery, in pituitary adenomas, all the way from the diagnostic controversies, the management of atypical, management of cavernous sinus involvement, the role of radiotherapy, all of these, the indication for craniotomy, uh, today, I'm going to do very briefly going to the best surgical approach, the management recurrent, and the management giant. Uh, best surgical approach, I, I think uh, everyone would agree now that the endoscopic approach really has come to be the approach of choice for, uh, for pituitary adenomas. And while people you know, who've done the microscopic have done 30 years, I say continue until you retire. But for younger people, who are coming, I think there's no question that the endoscopic approach is approach of choice. Beautiful visualization, medial wall of cavernous sinus, medial wall of, you can remove this giant tumor with no problem. And here is this patient, uh, uh, 10 years, beautiful removal as you see. So to me, there's no question that the endoscopic uh, pituitary surgery is the future and will become the standard of care of pituitary adenoma. So any young neurosurgeon who wants to do pituitary surgery, you better learn the endoscopic approach. The, uh, the second one is, of course, a managed recurrent. So very briefly, recurrent problems, uh, I mean, I was going to say, everyone would like this kind. This is a patient of mine 30 years ago that I presented with visual. He was done microscopically in that time. And uh, this patient is now 29 years, no recurrence. Beautiful thing. Unfortunately, this is not the usual. This is the more usual with the pituitary adenomas. 93, micro, microsurgical. Uh, uh, seven years later, recurrent microsurgical. Then uh, he came to me in 2007. I did an endoscopic. 2013, growth followed conservatively. Then further growth, repeat endoscopic. And then e cavernous sinus, what now? Well, this patient, uh, uh, that's the issue. So the, this is the more common problem with, uh, the, the, with the pituitary. So recurrent tumors, very common, very
very high incidence if you follow again long enough uh, up to 18 years these can follow and that's why in our pituitary clinic we do not discharge patients for 15 years 17 years we watch them sometime every two or three years but we keep following them the peak recurrence as you see one to five years but they can recur up to 18 years these are difficult problems increase morbidity uh, decrease favorable outcomes and there's no consensus again on the optimal uh, management of these tumors and if you look at the literature after microsurgical removal you see that in fact significant recurrence rates for growth adenoma i have my endocrinological colleagues say if you follow these patients long enough 20 years 80 90 percent will will uh, recur so the factors uh, uh, responsible for recurrence as you can see are incomplete tumor resection at the initial surgery, but there's also other issues, tumor biology, infiltration of uh, the adjacent structures like the cavernous sinus and these other uh, hormonal types, you know, these silent subtypes are very more aggressive. And of course, as I say here, duration of follow-up. These are the treatment options for recurrent adenomas, just like they are for, for, for uh, 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 um, initial uh, adenomas. A repeat surgery can carry a higher risk for morbidity and uh, a reduced chance of uh, uh, total removal. Radiation, as you'll see, is, has a role to play, medical therapy, chemotherapy, and combined therapy. So this is a patient who had a previous uh, Cushing, had a previous microsurgical, and you can see the endoscopic approach uh, gives us a much wider view. And as you can see here, if we take this off, we see the, the, uh, the tumor, the small adenoma, if this was gonna work, over here, it doesn't seem to be. There is an adenoma, beautiful little adenoma on the lateral side that was missed by the microsurgical approach. And this can then be nicely removed totally. And this patient, uh, as you can see after the removal, you can see the medial wall of cavernous sinus. You can see this, that phragma up here. And uh, this patient uh, uh, has a, a post-operative cortisol was normal, urine-free cortisol was normal. Seven years, he's in remission. So beautiful view of this. This is a, a persistent acromegaly, and you can see the problem here. He has a type one uh, cella, conchal basically. And the, uh, after the uh, microsurgical approach, he had persistent disease. And then so the beauty of the endoscopic approach allows us to, this is like almost a trans uh, uh, cellar, transclival that allows us to get to this tumor. And after the removal, this patient post-op is in remission from his acromegaly. Also the endoscopic approach, because we can use sometimes an expanded approach, here's kissing carotid. Look at, look at here, three millimeters. No way that you can get this there, but by going superiorly and sometimes in, uh, uh, doing a, a planum, transplanum approach allows us to remove this uh, to this tumor. And uh, this is this patient, uh, uh, again, I don't have time for a thing, but here's this patient postoperatively that you can see, uh, we still left some tumor inferiorly. And this is a patient uh, uh, with a uh, tumor that you can see here endoscopic uh, 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 previously, but then had uh, recurrence. So endoscopic can also have, just because you know, you went endoscopic, if you, you still relieve, uh, re, uh, uh, leave tumor, you can have a recurrence. He had a large recurrence. And this is after, he, this is the previous endoscopic. He's got a septotomy. Uh, this is, a, you can do a repeat endoscopic as shown here. We, do a, we were able to get another septal flap for, even from here. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to show you uh, that. And here we are now after the, uh, the tumor removal, recurrence. And this is after the removal uh, that allows us to get a nice radical removal of this tumor and the repair. And this is this uh, tumor uh, postoperatively. You see nice removal three weeks post-op. So uh, endoscopic uh, approaches uh, can be uh, uh, repeated. This is our series now, we're over 2,000 patients, and the major issue is, has the endoscopic technique improved our ability to deal with recurrent uh, adenomas? This is our series, uh, published now four or five years ago, for about 40 patients. This is, as you can see here, uh, the problem is that 43% had already frank cavernous sinus invasion. Our results revealed what we found in these recurrences that had previous uh, uh, microscopic was that the, the exposure was limited, just limited exposure, and uh, particularly the cellar opening. Uh, and in our philosophy is we always expose from medial wall of cavernous sinus to medial wall of cavernous sinus, from the anterior to cavernous sinus to the plenum, the four blues. Right? For any case that we do, I, I will uh, expose that. Here's our re results, 54% gross total rates. 
um, and 86% uh, for non-functioning adenoma. But once it went into the cavernous sinus, we were not able to get one that I felt I was able to get 100%. So the overall, the results in, uh, in most reported series suggest that the endoscopic, uh, there's less recurrences, uh, or at least there's better uh, uh, outcome uh, with the endoscopic approach than, than the uh, uh, repeat microsurgical approach. Uh, and then uh, let me just go quickly now uh, to the, um, to the, and then of course we have to understand that there are other treatment for these recurrences, conventional radiation, fractionated radiation, including gamma knife radiation, that, it, that it's possible if it's in the cavernous sinus and there's at least one or two millimeters between the, the optic nerve, gamma knife is a very good modality for this. And the, and the literature suggests that, in fact, as you see, these are remission rates in acromegaly up around between 40 to 60 percent, uh, uh, Cushing about 50 percent, but in non-functioning adenoma, very high uh, uh, remission, at least of stabilization, up to 90 percent. So the giant pituitary adenomas, which is the, my, my main uh, talk, these are, again, uh, really challenging uh, uh, lesions. The, the incidence is about 5 to 14 percent. They are in, uh, in, uh, associated with increased neurological and endocrine dysfunction. They have capacity for aggressive local growth, including adjacent structures into the cavernous sinus, et cetera. They are surgically challenging and, and rarely, if I can say, the low uh, ability to get a really a cure, a total removal. And the report suggests even less than 30 percent. And they are associated with increased uh, surgical morbidity and mortality and increased recurrence rates. And overall, the treatment outcomes are in these uh, giant adenomas uh, are uh, much worse with a long-term prognosis. So the treatment for giant, just like the regular ones, are the same type of treatments that you have. But I can say that the majority of these require often a multimodality. So here's a patient with a, a large pituitary adenoma. 58-year-old patient, bitemporal hemianopsia, endocrine normal, and with this adenoma, which I'll very quickly go through. There it is. Uh, you know, it's not a giant, giant, but this is considered full. We use basically uh, um, uh, size more than actual uh, volume, I was going to say. So here's this, uh, we, uh, we do a middle turbinectomy shown here. And then we take for these giant, we always do it, take a nasal septal flap. I think you know the risk of CSF leak rate is 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 higher. So the nasal septal flap to us is an assurance that you know the likelihood of a nasal of a CSF leak is low. Then again, a very wide wide sphenoidotomy that allows us to see a very nice view of the entire uh, sphenoid roof, and then the the, the uh, opening right up to the medial optic rotted recess lateral, and then of course the removal is just uh, the way you would do it. In the giant, always do it in a layered fashion. Remove the components inferiorly in the cellar floor. Then we go up the medial wall of cavernous sinus bilaterally, and finally the central component. And here we are, we're now looking very carefully uh, by retracting to make sure that we've not left any tumor laterally in the cavernous sinus. And this is after the removal. This is the, and there's a nasal septal flap that you can see uh, that uh, we use for the repair. And this is patient uh, one day post-op. We do always a CT scan at one day. And here's a patient at one year, nice removal of this uh, tumor. This is a 74-year-old patient with bitermal hemianopsia, hormonal replacement with cortisone with this uh, tumor here. And uh, again, using a, uh, an endoscopic uh, approach, here's the uh, exposure from medial wall of cavernous sinus to medial wall of cavernous sinus. Uh, we use it, ultrasound interoperatively all the time that con uh, confirms the location of the paracellar uh, carotids. And uh, here again, after removal of the inferior part of the tumor. And here with giant adenomas, it's not so often possible to get a, a, a extract capsule removal. Sometimes, however, it is. And this is after the removal of the, of the tumor. Uh, and this is the patient's uh, post-op. Uh, day uh, day one, you can see here some. The issue with these giant, you will always see some time postoperatively blood in the in the area, and you say, "My goodness, I had the diaphragma down. How can there be blood?" But that diaphragma goes up after the surgery with the, the retrain, so you'll get some blood. Not to worry if the vision is stable. Do not think you have to rush in or anything. And indeed, this patient, as you can see, after six months, that is all absorbed, and uh, and so uh, the, this area, this blood in the in the cavity of a giant 
is uh, is sometimes uh, seen and should you, one should not uh, rush in and reoperate. Now this is a larger tumor going anteriorly. This is a tumor that probably previously we would might do a craniotomy. Uh, now with our expanded approaches, we can do basically this uh, using an endoscopic approach. And uh, here we can see uh, the re the uh, the removal. Uh, of the cellar component, at least it's a sphenoid component, into the sphenoid, then this is the cellar component that we're taking out in the cella, um, and uh, that's taken out, and then what we're left with is the uh, component supercellar here that, that did not come down. So this is where we do then that trans uh, uh, planner approach, which I showed you with our craniopharyngiomas, that allows us to go above, basically, uh, the, uh, the tumor, and bring it down, as you can see here, is the, here's the diaphragma, uh, uh, arachnoid, and ultimately are able to get a nice uh, uh, radical removal of this tumor. Here's the, the, uh, the chiasm, there's the acom, here's the, uh, the, the uh, stock. Although we, we spared it, but of course the patient was panhypopit. Eight years, so you can see here, uh, with no evidence of uh, progression of the, any, any residual disease. Now this is a 34-year-old patient with MENS1 with this large adenoma. Uh, prolactin uh, initially was 200, but we know this is not a prolactinoma because a lesion like this should have a prolactin about thousands. So this was either a, uh, either a, a, a combined tumor that had multi-hormonal. Uh, should treat initially prolactin, however, six months later, stabilized, but no change in the tumor. What do we do now? Well, we did this patient with an expanded endoscopic approach, uh, as you can see here, but residual tumor here that was, that was not possible to remove into cavernous sinus. What now? This patient underwent fractionated radiation uh, uh, with 50 gray. Now is uh, five years, no evidence of disease recurrence. So for these giant adenomas, you sometimes need multimodality therapy. Uh, this is a 61-year-old patient just to show that these are can carry complications. This is a long-term standing visual decline, virtually blind, as you can see here. What is the best approach? Well, here we would do an endoscopic approach. Um, and uh, this patient, as you can see, postoperatively, probably we talked about in craniopharyngioma about perforator injury. This is what happened in this patient, likely a perforator injury. You can see an ischemic event in the, in the thalamus. The patient was hemiplegic uh, with cognitive uh, dysfunction, and in fact, worsening of vision. So these uh, tumors are very challenging, and you have to understand that they can carry significant uh, risks. There are limitations to the endoscopic approach. Like I said, for craniopharyngioma and these large tumors like this, uh, sometimes we still need, fortunately not often, but at least maybe 3%, 3 to 5%, we still need a, a, a craniotomy. And this is a, a, such a tumor, this large tumor going out that you can see here that I basically did this using an interhemispheric transbasal approach. And here we are, the tumors, here the ACOM. And so we are allowed to work just the way we do for craniopharyngioma. Uh, below, uh, uh, prechismatic and superiorly, that allows us to get a nice radical uh, removal of this uh, tumor. 15 years, it just goes to show you no evidence of disease recurrence, even though we know we must have left some tumor there. So this is our series, which was published, uh, I think, uh, four or five years ago of uh, large giant anadomas. And uh, the definition, if you go in the literature and you ask what is a giant, some people use diameter, greater than four diameters. Some people, you know, use other... Uh, and uh, what we use for our series are volume-based because we thought that was better uh, to do that. So uh, in our definition, any volume greater than 10 cc's was defined as larger giant. And we think that this may be provide a more sensitive measure of tumor, uh, of tumor bulk rather than maximum diameter. The parameters, we see that we looked at all of these, looking at outcome, uh, including extent of resection, and we also wanted to look at this, the issue of uh, predictors. What predicted the ability of, of resection? This is our, our, uh, the, the series, 73 patients, again, 12 to 14% of our, of our series. Here's the demographics that you see here. Um, uh, Spenous sinus uh, invasion was in 35%, and 16% had prior surgery. 4% had even prior radiation. The presentation as often is, is a, a majority were visual uh, problems that you can see here, even some with cranial nerve palsies, and these are the average uh, volume and parameters. This is the type of pathology, anywhere from, you know, uh, corticotrophs, most of them were, were gonadotroph, uh, at least non-functioning adenomas, and basically we use an endoscopic approach for all of these, 
um, uh, and an expanded approach in one third of the patients, we did a, a, an expanded approach. Now this is our results. So you see the gross tumor rates was not really that good. And this is what the reality is of these tumors. They're very challenging. Only 24% where we felt we had a gross total removal. Near total was about 16%. So gross total, near total around 41%. Uh, the predictor, this is very interesting, uh, of the extent of resection. What predicted? The maximum diameter, of course, everybody would, it's not surprising. The preoperative volume, so the volume was as, uh, also uh, important. Hemorrhagic, so if you had a previous hemorrhage, the tumor would be more fibrous and, and uh, would, uh, uh, would, it more, makes it more difficult to remove. And then, of course, invasion, the cavernous sinus was very important. The non-significant parameters, interesting, was uh, apoplexy was not, prior radiation and surgery was not, which surprised uh, me, and these other ones. Even these, the cell uh, uh, markers, which we thought would be MIB, it was not significant in our uh, series. This is the visual improvement, as you can see here. We had a good uh, degree of visual improvement in the majority of cases, uh, or normal, so over 90%, or uh, uh, 78, 88% that stable were or, or uh, improved. The complication rate, you can see CSF leak, I think was about 9%. And this is other series that you can see here. This is uh, uh, the Pittsburgh group, again, showing the same uh, near total removal, only about 30%. Uh, this is systemic review uh, by Comatar, again, showing the endoscopic approach of having a, a significantly better ability to remove the tumor in terms of gross tone resection than the uh, uh, open approaches. This is our own series uh, 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 meta-analysis that we uh, that one of my fellows did, looking at uh, the management of giant uh, uh, pituitary adenomas uh, endoscopically. As you can see, the gross tumor rates were 32%, very similar to to our patients. With the leak rates 8%. So, the conclusion, and again, looking at quality of evidence. That's all we when we make a conclusion, all we can do. And again, there's no level one evidence on uh, of these, but that the endoscopic approach can obtain an extent of resection equal or higher than transcranial techniques for giant midline located tumors. Endoscopic approaches are safer and more effective in alleviating the symptoms. Transcranial roots, however, are still uh, occasionally necessary for tumors extending lateral uh, to the, into the middle fossa or uh, in the middle fossa. Anterior, usually now we can use an extended approach. And radiation therapy has a definite role to play in controlling religious uh, uh, disease or seizures. So recurrent and large paternity you know, remains a significant surgical challenge, regardless, again, of the approach. The pure endoscopic approach can provide equivalent or possibly better outcomes. However, recurrent and giant pituitary adenomas often require a multidisciplinary approach with adjuvant radiation and or medical therapy to affect long-term control. So management of recurrent giant adenomas required an experienced surgeon, but as well an experienced multidisciplinary team, including endocrinologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and pituitary neuropathologists. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, do you use uh, any transcranial transdoppler through the endoscope? Did, did you manage to use a Doppler to see the carotid in such all, giant all, uh, pituitaries? Yeah, all the time. We use routinely. Image guidance is very important. So we use image guidance for every case, but also Doppler. It's very critical in these giant ones that can shift the carotid to, to use it in every case, uh, the Doppler ultrasound. And in case of gamma knife, have you had any uh, aneurysm development after the gamma knife? Because I had two cases of cranio who developed the aneurysm after gamma knife, a year after that, gamma knife. I'm sorry, that developed what after gamma knife? Aneurysm. aneurysm. An aneurysm, wow, no, I must say, I don't know how long after you had that done, but uh, in gamma knife, we're very careful with regard to gamma knife. You know, we have to make sure that the, 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 the tumor is uh, uh, in the cavernous sinus, usually for only cavernous sinus. For giant or these residual, we always use fractionated uh, radiation. And we've not had uh, uh, to date any aneurysm uh, 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 formation. Uh, we have delayed pituitary hyperfunction that we know happens with radiation in terms of, you know, um, 
uh, most of these people already have problems with their hormones uh, anyways. <clears throat> Thank you. I think uh, we have in the panel a question. Is there a cost effectiveness analysis comparing radical versus conservative surgery of craniopharyngioma? Interesting. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Um, you know, we, are, we have done some studies in, um, in um, uh, how do you say, uh, in meningiomas because we wanted to see, you know, for uh, endoscopic expanded uh, in, in meningiomas, and we published this, and the interesting was that the cost effective was a slightly higher uh, uh, cost for endoscopic than, than, uh, than the open. But in craniopharyngioma, I'm not aware uh, of any cost uh, effective analysis. Okay, another question. Uh, what you are going to do if you find a calcified portion of craniopharyngioma, and you are doing endoscopic uh, removal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's all depending, uh, as I showed you in one of the videos, you know, you can get a lot of calcification, but if you have a very rock hard uh, 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 cranial that's attached to a, a vessel, and we've had uh, one to the basilar artery, I'm not going to remove that. I'll leave that and then and, and deal with it, you know, with radiation. Any any risk to any major vascular structures, it's it's not worth to me, it's not worth the risk to attempt that. Okay. I have somebody who's raising his hand, Professor Muhammad Fahmi. Hello. From Alexandria University. Hello, everybody. Hi. My voice. Hi, this is uh, Professor Muhammad Fahmi Zaid from Alexandria. Faculty of Medicine. Uh, first, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gentili, for your uh, presentation. However, uh, as regarding the classification again, classification of large craniopharyngeal, and uh, the point is the difference between the uh, endoscopic and the craniotomy is not only depending on the size. I mean that it depends on the exact location. For example, if we have a large portion retrocellular going to the climate from the craniopharyngioma, whether cystic or not, if we have a large portion paracellular eroding or extending into the cavernous sinus, we can uh, know about the patency of the internal carotid, of course, but all of that is not only depend on the size. Sometimes we found uh, a 2.5 centimeter going mainly, for example, retrocellular. Are you going to do it again by endoscopic? This is the first part. So, so my. Second my... Part, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me, let me finish the first one. So to me, uh, retrocellular is not. The endoscopic approach is a beautiful for retrocellular. It's like we do a chordoma. When we do a chordoma, we do a transclival approach to the retrocellular area. That is not to me a contraindication. Paracellular, yes. A craniopharyngioma going significantly lateral middle fossa is not a good uh, case for, for yeah. an endoscopic, and that should be open. Yeah, I a agree about The retrocellular is a good approach. The endoscopic approach is a good approach yeah. for the, the retrocellular. Actually, I have uh, presented a paper on the European Association of Neurological uh, Surgery exactly on October 2014. It is uh, six uh, years back. About 3D uh, classification of the paracellular tumor with a craniopharyngioma uh, <clears throat> or uh, large pituitary. I can submit this, uh, the paper, uh, of course, uh, later to Professor Nasser el Gandur to be presented. Second part of my inquiry is uh, the similarity, of course, for the sobra and the barracella between the pituitary and the craniopharyngioma is present on the anatomical base. However, it is a, a large difference on pathological base. What I mean is that you can easily dissect, 
from my side of my view, the pituitary was para or retrocellular. However, the solid craniopharyngioma, especially if partially the wall is calcified, is a very big problem. I saw in Japan, uh, sometimes a classified part could be broken down by uh, uh, bonicosa, or we can say the sunibet, sunobot, okay? They can break down the calcified part which is attached to the major vessel like the basilar. What about your view of that? I mean, I, the I small am... or, or large is not a large tumor. However, by pathology, is greatly different from the pituitary with supracellular exchange. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I, I totally understand the, the, the question, but my, my point is with, you know, with a solid component, very firm, hard, uh, 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 calcified, I am very careful and in terms of that, and, and they're attached to vascular structure. I never use a sonoped. It's a very, I consider it a dangerous instrument. Uh, uh, so if I can get, at a, using microsurgical technique, I can see a plane, but if there's an issue that it's stuck to it, to me for craniopharyngioma, uh, uh, I do not uh, attempt a radical excision of, uh, of those. Uh, once more, you don't use Sonovet on uh, endoscopic or on the uh, open surgery. Oh, oh uh, I don't use it for either open or endoscopic. For, uh, for, on the bush way, you don't use it. For, no. for calcified leaves, you don't use it. Okay. No. Okay. No. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. I think uh, Rami answered all the questions. Yeah. And uh, I think it's time to close the webinar. At the end of this webinar, I would like to thank our speakers, Professor Fred Gentili. Thank you very much for giving us such honor. I'd like to thank Professor Rami Amin for moderating this session. I'd like to thank Professor Mohammed Biltagi for his presentation. Thanks to Omar Youssef for helping me in organizing this webinar. Thanks to Utopia Pharma. Thanks to all attendants. And uh, I would like to announce about another webinar tonight at 9 p.m. Professor Michael Luton about uh, management of intracranial complex aneurysms. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much to all. Thank you very much. Bye bye now. I'm going to I'm going to operate now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Best wishes. Best wishes. Thank you. Okay.